you hear me? I'm Tiziana Tedesco, and on behalf of Eco Canada and our board of directors, welcome back to Great Italian Wines, a series of masterclasses where we discover indigenous grape varieties and talk about some of the best wines Italy has to offer. This event is part of the True Italian Taste Project, which is promoted and financed by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. This time we will move to central Italy and we will focus on Sangiovese and Bernaccia di San Gimignano. Before asking our certified sommelier, Sandra Colosimo, to start the class, I would like to introduce Anna Mamoliti of Cabinona, Veroni's exclusive wine agency, to say a few words and to let you know about Cabinona's offer tonight, especially for you. Let me just say thank you to Cabinona first for joining us in presenting Great Italian Wines. And also thank you to all of you who have connected with us tonight. We really appreciate your enthusiasm and participation in such great numbers. Please keep following us and send us your feedbacks and comments like you always do. And we thank you so much for this. We're planning many exciting new events for you and we will let you know about them in the upcoming weeks. So grazie and Anna, please, Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Astrid, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, what a great event this is going to be. On behalf of Taroni and Cavinona, it has, it has been a pleasure and an honor to collaborate with Eco Canada and to be part of the True Italian Taste. It's always great to work with people who are like-minded and who share the same philosophy, which is to bring the best of the best that Italy has to offer to the Canadian market and hence to all of our guests here at our restaurants, whether this be food or wine. So this is always uh, such a pleasure. Um, that's exactly why we started our Cavinona agency. Uh, Cavinona was formed as our commitment to providing and introducing the Canadian market with many different indigenous grape varietals that Italy has to offer. And they have thousands of different varietals. Wines that perhaps the LCBO would consider risky to bring in, yet we consider it important to understanding the so many wine regions of Italy. There's always educating to be done uh, when introducing anything new to the market um, that goes for food and for wine. And we spend a lot of uh, hours educating our staff um, to then educate our, our customers who can then enjoy these wonderful products that we, we bring in, uh, whether it's prosciutto or tomatoes, and the star of the show tonight, the wines, um, Chianti Classico and Bernaccia di San Gimignano. I'd like to thank Corrado, Paina, Tiziana Tedesco, and Astrid Durzo, Durzo sorry, for um, all their efforts in making this happen and for spotlighting Italy um, and all the wonderful things that, that Italy and the various regions have to offer. And finally, to all of you who are participating this evening, um, I know we have a wonderful turnout. We truly hope that you enjoy this presentation and have some takeaways um, from the beautiful region of Tuscany um, and uh, enjoy these two wines. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Sandra, but I also would like to let you know that there is a code um, uh, that we were, gonna, we're gonna post on the group chat this evening. Um, you can either type it, it's ECO, I-C-C-O, March, you'll see it. Uh, we're happy to give uh, anyone who would like to order any of these wines a discount um, um, in the coming days. So without further ado, Sandra, you can take over. And once again, thank you and enjoy. Hello, everybody. Buonasera a tutti and welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. And it's my pleasure to connect with you again and spend the next hour talking about some wonderful wine and and then tasting it and talking about all the wonderful aromas and flavors. So on this uh, class of this month, we travel to the wonderful region of Tuscany. Um, it is one of the most important and famous wine regions in the world. Um, and it is a particularly special place for me as I lived there for 20 years. And so as they say, you don't forget your first love. And my first love was the Tuscan wines, which started and ignited my passion uh, for my wine journey and brought me to where I am today. Uh, the Tuscan wine culture and wines um, is part of their everyday life. As we know, we think of the piazzas, um, it's part of their everyday culture. Tonight we'll be exploring the great varieties of Vernaccia and San Gimignano. All good wines begin in the vineyard and these 
we have chosen two wines that um, are authentic expressions of their territory. So the first wine that we'll be uh, tasting in a little bit is the Salva Bianca 2019, the Nacho di San Gimignano, DOCG. And then we'll be trying a wonderful Tuscan Red, um, which is Vigna Calvacione 2017, Chianti Classico, DOCG, by the wonderful uh, winery Istina. We also have a wonderful, for those of you, <laughs> A wonderful antipasto plate produced by Spaccio, which is Tedoni's production kitchen. And we have some wonderful DOP cheeses. Uh, we have some uh, uh, Pecorino Toscano DOP and uh, Grana Padano and some wonderful Pinocchiona, which is a Florentine salami. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, which has some wonderful fennel seeds. And we also have the Tostini, uh, for the fegatini, which is another um, specialty in Florence, as well as the schiacciata made from our kitchen and some wonderful olives, just to uh, enhance the experience. Okay, so let's get started with the uh, first slide. Thank you. Uh, Tuscany uh, is the oldest wine producing region um, in Italy and um, it was settled by the Etruscans in 8th century BC. As when we think of Tuscany, we think of the wonderful rolling hills. So it's to no surprise that 67% of the terrain is hilly. And we know that vines uh, do like to grow on hilly um, uh, terrain. Fourth most planted region in Italy, and it is, uh, in terms of wine production, the sixth. Um, this is an important note because it's about the quality and not the quantity. There has been a lot of change in the Chianti and Chianti classical and Tuscan productions over the years, and there's been an increased attention in terms of quality. Okay. Um, Tuscany is a producer of world-class wines or lemon DOCG. So after Piemonte, uh, Veneto, uh, Tuscany has the third most uh, number of DOCGs with 41 uh, DOCs and six IGTs. Tuscany is the quintessential uh, image of Italian vineyards and wine country. The scenic countryside of rolling hills with ancient towns, uh, stone castles, olive trees, cypress trees. We think of the famous sunflower fields and lots of beautiful vineyards. Uh, wine production, if you could just, okay, wine production um, is 85% or wines is 85% red and 15% white. Sangiovese is king and it's the most planted grape variety. When you think of Sangiovese, you may not know, but that is it. the main grape for Chianti, Chianti Classico, Brunello di Montalcino, uh, Vino Nobile di Montepulciano are just some of the most famous wines. Vernata di San Gimignano is a DOCG, and it is the only uh, white wine DOCG in Tuscany. It is a noble uh, grape with a very long history. Okay, so here's a map for you just to sort of uh, give you an idea of the different areas that we'll be looking at. So we're looking between, so between Florence and Siena here, we've got the uh, large county region. In the center here, which we'll be talking about is the County Classico. Uh, move down, we have Montalcino. Moving south, then we have Montepulciano. Um, and then further down, we have the wonderful region of Maremma. San Gimignano, as we, for those of you who I'm sure have visited, San Gimignano is a wonderful medieval town and we know it for its wonderful um, towers. It is a UNESCO world site and it is um, also known for saffron and very famously for its Venaccio di San Gimignano. San Gimignano, uh, the earliest records go back to 1276 um, from the town's archives. Um, it says that um, 
during those times, they would uh, charge a tax for anybody who was going in or out of the um, San Gimignano uh, Vernaccia vineyards. It was also mentioned in the, in the Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri. Um, it was also a stopping point uh, to Rome on the Francigena in the Middle Ages and Renaissance. Is a very favorite wine of popes, kings, and Lorenzo di Medici. So, if you can imagine at the time when you have the old ancient roads that led to Rome, um, it was a, a very um, important stopping point where they would pick up the wine to bring it over to Rome. Uh, Lorenzo di Medici was known to order um, the Nacho di San Gimignano regularly. Venata di San Gimignano. So um, it was it's a very important wine because it was the first wine to receive DOC status in 1966. It then later received DOCG status in 1993. And I believe it was the second white wine to achieve that high status. So as we talked about the last time, the DOCG status is a denomination of origin uh, controlled and guaranteed. So uh, the Vernaccia di San Gimignano is a wine that is not uh, readily available here in Ontario. We're very lucky to have it. It is uh, a star among uh, the red of when we think of Tuscany and all the wonderful red wines. Next. The characteristics of the um, Vernaccia di San Gimignano, it's a white skin grape, yellow uh, with green color and amber spots. It's in big, big bunches, medium-sized berries. The soil, it prefers sandstone with marley clay soil. High altitudes, and as we saw from the last lesson, uh, that's a very common uh, denominator. Uh, vines thrive in high altitudes, uh, but they cannot be over 500 meters above sea level. Uh, harvest is late September to early October. Um, the soil is rich, I would just want to, is rich in uh, calcareous soil, marl, sandstone, because the region once in uh, centuries and uh, many, many years ago, undersea, leaving fossilized remains. And so these vines thrive on these mineral rich soils. So here's a picture of the Venaccio di San Gimignano, as you can see. Actually, this is from um, our winery here. Um, and this is during harvest for their hand picking. We'll, we'll look at that very soon. Okay, the, CO, uh, the DOCG of San Gimignano is a minimum of 85% Venaccio, um, which has to be exclusively cultivated in that area. Um, this wine, which we'll be tasting, so as we're going through this, please start to uh, sniff and uh, see what you think. But this is a 100% Vinata di San Gimignano. So, uh, but the discipline uh, has to be a minimum of 85 and the uh, remaining 15% has to be from authorized uh, local uh, white grapes. Um, basically with the DOCG, uh, the Nacho di San Gimignano, there is the Annata or the vintage um, with a minimum alcohol content of 10.5%. Uh, and then there's also, which is not as common in white wines, is there's a Reserva and there the minimum is an aging of 11 months in wood and three months in bottle. Um, again, then with a higher uh, minimum alcohol. Um, so that's, that's very interesting to, to note. Okay, the wine characteristics. So let's take a look. And uh, these are the general wine characteristics of the Vinatia, and then we'll, we'll take a look here. But I can tell you that I'm gonna take the quote from uh, Michelangelo Bonarossi, um, who in 1643 um, described the Vinatia di San Gimignano and he called and he described it as a grape that uh, kisses, licks, bites, slaps, and stings. So that's what we'll be trying. And then you can tell me what you think. Um, so the great Michelangelo, uh, that's his description. 
Um, so in terms of color, you want to look at the color. Uh, generally, it's a light straw yellow, uh, transparent. The aromas and flavors um, are delicate white flowers. Uh, some of the aromas you can get are uh, white fruit, golden apples, green apples, uh, citrus accents, honey, um, and the characteristic slight bitter almond aftertaste. The palate, this is a wonderfully dry, crisp uh, wine, sapid and medium body. Okay, so we're gonna, there's the wonderful San Gimignano. So we can go to our wine tasting. And I just want to talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> the, uh, the winery here. Um, the Il Colombaio di Santa Chiara. Um, Il Colombaio di Santa Chiara is located just a few kilometers away from San Gimignano. Um, their story is about family, passion, and their territory. Actually, both these wonderful producers share a common uh, denominator um, where they, it's all about the passion of the family. Um, and hard work and, and simple beginnings. The company was founded in 2002 uh, when Alessio Logi, the youngest of three brothers, was studying enology and he wanted to put this passion and, and, um, and work and study to work. Together with his brothers, uh, Stefano and Don Piero and their father, Mario, they started the company. So it's a relatively young uh, company. Mario, the father, uh, worked in the family farm since he was a teenager in the 50s. Um, and he also purchased uh, a few years before they started a parish uh, in San Donato and, uh, and the land around it. It actually became their wine cellar uh, when they first started. Uh, today, it's a beautiful, there's Mario. Um, and I love that picture because you get uh, the feeling of the land, the territory, the hard work. So he's been working the land. And here are the three brothers um, who run the company today with their father. This is their, um, their harvesting, everything. They are um, biological, organic, uh, and everything is hand harvested, as you can see, and put into crates. Um, so in a short period of time, their hard work has uh, dedication to their quality has uh, resulted in um, great results and they've received considerable recognition from wine critics. They have about 20 hectares. Um, their vineyards are uh, 350 to 390, just under 400 meters above sea level. Um, as I mentioned, they're certified organic. And it's 100%. This is a, a wonderful expression. And we chose these wines because, in our opinion, it is um, an authentic expression for you to try the Bernata di San Gimignano in purezza, 100%. Um, the, so I mentioned everything. The harvesting is end of September, uh, done by hand. The vinification um, is done in cement vats and stainless steel tanks. And uh, the wine is left on the leaves until the beginning of March. Um, the alcohol content is 13%. So I think we're ready to do our wine tasting. So take your glass. So as we said, it is a beautiful uh, light straw yellow color, transparent. Um, if you want to really take a look and see the green hues, uh, you can see them now, but if you have a white paper, it's the best with a white background and take a look around the border of your glass and you can see the, the light green reflection. Um, in, when you're evaluating color or looking at the color, it's a beautiful transparent, it's uh, luminous. Um, in a Reviseva, for example, the green reflects a younger wine and in a reserva, um, something that's aged in wood, this hasn't been aged in wood, um, you can expect maybe more of a golden tinge. So white wines, as they get older, they, they, the color enhances. Um, so if you wanna uh, 
take a, uh, a look at uh, a sniff. What do you think about that? You want to swirl your glass to let the oxygen in and release some of those aromas and put your nose into the glass and keep taking small whiffs. And I smell some wonderful fresh white flowers. I do get minerality. Uh, I, uh, that's one thing that comes right through. I get a bit of hay. Do you smell hay? White flowers, very delicate. And a little bit of a, of a citrus note. Um, one thing about, I should say about, uh, a lot of people ask me about the aromas, it does take a lot of time and practice. And so it takes, uh, it's about building your memory bank and um, it's just, it, it does take time to, to make those connections. And also what's helpful is to smell things, smell spices, smell fruits. And, and so it helps to make the connection and build that memory. There's also um, um, an aroma which we call perhaps uh, in Italian, it's called pietra focaia um, or wet stone. Um, and this is something that um, comes with the minerality. Pietra focaia is the old rock that uh, are found in the area as well, that are used for uh, gunfire in the past in the ancient times. And it's the, the type of rock that was used in ancient times to cut wood. Um, but it's hard to know what that smells like, but uh, something that we say is uh, something like close to like wet stones, if you can think of that dampness. Mm, it's, a, it's a beautiful, um, intense, um, and a nice complexity to the aroma. Okay, so next we're gonna move to, I wish I could hear you guys and, and receive your comments. Um, we're now gonna move to the palette. So. Beautiful, pleasant, fresh, uh, vibrating, and very importantly, there's a savory sapido, which we say in Italian, sapid flavor. It's not harsh. It's uh, and there's a wonderful weight on your on your tongue and your mouth. And very importantly, there's a long finish. It's persistent. I could still taste it, and there is a, a characteristic, almost uh, bitter taste, which is quite, um, which is common with the Vernaccia di San Gimignano. So I hope you've enjoyed that, and you can just—it's just so pleasant and so food friendly as well. This goes very well with uh, antipasto plates. It goes very well with white meats, fish, uh, calamari fritti. I can just uh, see myself sitting perhaps in a, on a terrace soon. Um, and hopefully we'll be traveling somewhere too in a terrace. Uh, you can picture on a, on a, in, in piazzas in a, on a hot summer night. So I hope you've enjoyed that, but it's just a wonderful expression of the vernaccia. And the main thing is, is that it's clean, it's fresh, you can feel it on the tongue, um, and this wonderful uh, sapido or uh, savory flavor. And there's just a wonderful persistence afterwards. Okay, so I think, um, I don't know if there's any time for questions, if anybody has any questions. 
Thanks, Sandra. Uh, yes, I was actually just uh, trying to um, catch your attention for a couple of questions. Uh, so one question that came in the chat was, if you could just uh, briefly explain what SAPID means exactly? That's a good question. I have to say, because um, sap in, in Italian, we say sapido. And sapido, and, and the word in English is sapid. Um, but we use in wine terms perhaps savory, um, which means it, it is related to almost, you can feel right now, I can still taste it. There's a bit of saltiness. There's a slight uh, saltiness that you feel. There's savory, sort of on the opposite scale of the sweetness, of course. Um, you can also get that often um, in areas that are near the sea, for example. So it is savory. And it goes very well with um, with uh, savory dishes as well. Um, does that help? Does that it's salt? It's um, it's almost you can taste it. I can still taste it. Can you taste that? It's hard. It's so hard because I don't have the interaction. But can you taste that uh, salt um, flavors? That's what it is. Okay, we'll keep an eye on the chat and see if uh, they reply. Uh, maybe uh, the people that are trying to wine alongside with you can uh, send us some comments. It's savory, um, savory. And the serving temperature should be around 11 to 12 degrees Celsius. Um, okay, if you have time, I'd like to just ask you another quick question before we move on to the second wine. Um, mm -hmm. Is Vin Santo made with Vernaccia di San Gimignano? Ah. That's another interesting question. Vin Santo um, is a sweet wine and it's made with uh, Trebbiano and uh, Malvasia. Um, it's not the Vernaccia di, um, di San Gimignano, but it is a wonderful um, uh, straw wine. It's a sweet wine. It's made by uh, with the drying of the grapes. Um, and uh, for people who've traveled uh, uh, through Tuscany know the famous Cantucci that you dip into your Vin Santo and it's gaining a lot of increased um, attention and popularity here as well. It's just hard to find. So um, the Vinaccia di San Gimignano, I can tell you is very difficult. So I'm very glad that we, uh, you can get it through uh, Cavinone. It is a very special um, and important uh, variety and oftentimes we don't hear enough about it but it is considered one of the most uh, noble uh, varieties in Italy. Thank you Sandra. Okay so I hope you're enjoying it. Have some cheese. It goes it's wonderful with the cheese um, and uh, I just, I, I hope you, it's, it's, it's fresh, it's, it's food friendly. And what we like about it is that sometimes white wines can be mm, thin uh, or thinner or lighter. Um, but this has a wonderful um, elegance about it. And I can still taste the, the, the savoriness actually. Um, so I hope you enjoyed it. We can move on to, if you're interested, <laughs> we can move on to the Sangiovese. Uh, yeah, I think we can go to the second wine. We have uh, no more questions at the moment, and then we can uh, get back to the questions after. Okay. Thank Sounds you. Good. Yes, I want to make sure we get enough time with the wine tasting so um, we can get going with the Sangiovese. Sangiovese, the mighty Sangiovese. Um, many people sometimes uh, can say, if I say Chianti, if I say Chianti Classico, if I say Brunello, people recognize those. If I say that they're made, uh, that the main uh, grape is Sangiovese, then uh, people are surprised because you don't often see Sangiovese on the label, um, like Vernaccia di San Gimignano. Um, so the Sangiovese is king of the Tuscan vineyard, and we'll take a look at all the uh, important wines. It is also a very uh, important variety in Italy and in the world. So it's one of the most important varieties in Italy uh, and one of the top 10 in terms of production in the world. Um, it is, um, in Italy, it's concentrated in central Italy. 
and um, and about in Sandra is it uh, makes up about 10% of the national uh, Italian vineyards in terms of production. Um, in it is like I said, king in Tuscany because over 60% of the Tuscan vineyards are Sangiovese. So as we travel through those wonderful roads of of uh, Chianti and Montalcino, uh, those are most of them are a lot of them are Sangiovese. Uh, so like I said, concentrated in Tuscany, but there are other regions that also uh, produce um, that harm. Um, that produces Sangiovese, that grows Sangiovese, I should say, and that's Umbria, Marche, Emilia Romagna, um, all the way down to the south. Um, the key thing to know about San, uh, Sangiovese is that it's a bit of a contrast to say, but it is a little bit finicky. What does that mean? Well, we're saying it does produce like 10% um, of the uh, of, of national vineyards and and it's produced in many regions in Italy, the difference is, is the quality. So that's what the important part of the Sangiovese is. It's not just the quantity, and but where it's grown and how it's grown, and it's all about the quality. So Sangiovese, the origins are not exactly known. Um, of course, it's one of the native grapes of uh, Tuscany, and they think that they could have come from the Etruscans because we know the Etruscans settled into Tuscany. And they think that one of the theories that it was a, a domesticated wild vines over the years. There are many clones to Sangiovese like other grapes, but there are many clones, like maybe over a hundred, um, which is basically clones. Um, it is the word that we use, but it, it sounds perhaps that it was done in a lab, and that's not the case. It's just different varieties um, uh, that have developed over the years. In 2000, when a lot of the DNA testing started, um, there is some hypothesis that maybe um, it was coming, it's coming from the south. Um, and it's across from Cilio Giolo and Calabrese di Montenuovo variety. So basically to say that um, it is definitely, you know, it's been around in Tuscany for centuries, uh, perhaps maybe uh, one time coming in from uh, Southern Italy when there was a lot of exchange between Tuscany and Southern Italy. Okay. Ah. Uh, so um, I wanted to include these because I think they're just wonderful and they're called uh, Le Bouquette del Vino, which translates into little wine holes. Now, um, what are these little, they're, they're fabulous. There's about, um, for many, many years when I lived there, even um, they, they weren't, in the, not a lot of attention was placed on them. And over the years, I think in 2015, a, a cultural association even started it to try and locate them and document them. And these are literally little wine holes where noble families um, would put these wine doors to sell their wine. So they were like Palazzi Signorili of the important families. And we know there are a lot of important families. So the shape is like a tabernacle, but basically they're little windows or doors that open. So as we know, um, centuries ago, wine making, wine producing um, was with the noble families. And so they would be able to sell their wine. Now the size of the little window um, is basically the size to fit a fiasco. The fiasco are the bottles with, you know, when we think of, <laughs> of, of Chianti or wine, it's the bottle with the, with the straw around them. So they're big enough so that they could open up and, and uh, give you the bottle um, and then you would return the empty bottle. So, so, so interesting. Um, there's over a uh, hundred, uh, uh, maybe even like 170 um, in Florence um, and 145 in the center. So if you can, if you look at the picture there with the fresco on the building, sort of right underneath the number, you could see that there's a little door there. Um, so 
this is just to show you basically how important uh, the history and the culture and how it's all related in terms of wine. Um, the other thing is, is that they've, they were also, uh, they became popular in 1630. Oh, and the other thing is that they, they, uh, they like to use them because you didn't have to pay taxes also. <laughs> so the, the noble family could sell you the wine without being, without taxing. And then these uh, wine windows or bouquette, they became very important during the plague of 1630 um, to serve wine and wine through the windows. It very interestingly, in the past year with all everything that we've gone through with uh, various uh, shutdowns, et cetera, some people have reopened some, some of them had them open, but they weren't in function. So, uh, in function, they weren't working, but they've, in the past year, there's been a lot of tension um, on these doors because of the virus. So some restaurants have gained attention because of it. And some of them you'll just see walking through the, uh, through the streets of Florida, you'll see some of them are cemented and cold and some of them they've opened up. So that's the story. So the historical note, San Giovese, um, in terms of the definition is the blood of Jove or Jupiter. There are, there are various hypotheses as to where the name comes, but that's the most popular. Um, in terms of documentation, um, even though it's such an important grape and goes way, way back, and we think to the time of the Etruscans, there's very little documentation, if we can say little. Uh, the earliest is 1590. Um, and it was mentioned uh, by the name of San Gioghetto by Soderini in his um, tri uh, treatise on the cultivation of grape varieties. Then in the late 1600s, um, San Gioetto, uh, which is a famous painting by Bartolomeo del Bimbo, uh, Bimbo, artist of the Medici court. The reason why I'm mentioning this is because um, Yes, the painting is very important, but the artists, we know that the Medici's were so important and part of the, uh, the Renaissance. And so if they were making a painting in regards to San Giovese, it, just, it tells you just how important San Giovese and wine was to the culture going centuries back. 1716, Il Bando. This is when um, Cosmo III, the Medici, defined boundaries of county, which today is a county classical. Um, so this is really, really interesting. And, you know, we sort of say maybe it was the first appellation, perhaps. Um, and now that area that was defined, those boundaries, it's what is the County Galonero um, territory today. 1857, uh, important name. Again, it's just to highlight certain things. I, um, Clemente Santi. Um, this is very important because uh, this is when um, at an important uh, exposition, the Universal Exposition in Paris, um, the critics say it, uh, his wine, which was a Brunello, uh, was recognized. And so being in Paris with the French, uh, that was um, very, very important. Uh, 1872, um, Bettino di Casoli began researching, experimenting with wine production, uh, which he referred to as San Giovetto, and, and that's where he uh, indicates that it's the main component of the Chianti Classico, so basically um, connecting uh, the, the San Giovese as the main component. Um, to as, as the, uh, the county classical recipe per se. There's just uh, to give you an idea that the, the, the famous painting, but okay, that's the copy of the Bando by the Grand uh, Duke of Tuscany, Cosmo III. So San Giovese, this is a very important in the whole wine uh, producing area. You can see there's just a, there's a lot of the historical richness and importance. Okay. So this is the wonderful San Giovese grape. You can see it's um, blue, blue color. Um, ah, the other thing is, is that the San Giovese berries and uh, in terms of its clones, 
and we'll take a look at that. Um, but the Brunello di Montalcino uses Sangiovese, what we call Sangiovese Grosso. And so the, the, the berries are, are bigger. Okay. Characteristics of Sangiovese. It buds early. Some of the, these characteristics are important because when we think of the temperature and the climate, this is why I mentioned it and, and thinking of frost and thinking of Tuscany, we know, we know we have beautiful warm summers, Mediterranean Sea, we've got the glorious sun. However, we also know that vineyards like to grow uh, in altitude. So we have to keep that in mind if it buds early, you know, some of the, they need to worry about sort of early frost. It's slow ripening. Um, it ripens, so it needs time so that it ripens. Um, you need sun. Uh, it thrives on hillsides, high altitudes. Um, direct, you need the direct sunlight, uh, warmth, dry climate. So as you can see, Tuscany, the hillside is 67% hill in Tuscany. You can see why the San Giovese thrives in this area. And it's not only a matter that it grows there, but it is quality. Uh, the soils, uh, San Giovese um, thrives on Galestro and Alberese. It is very sensitive to terroir and the expressions of San Giovese can vary from being young and lively um, to being more structured, fuller and rounder. So that's, it all depends on where and the style of the wine. The, okay, Tuscany, there we go. I just want to re um, sort of look at the map again and see where we are. Um, again, we've got the wonderful seaside, we've got Firenze, Siena, um, which is about 80 kilometers, then you have Montalcino, which is about 40 kilometers south of Siena, um, and so, and then we have, um, Chianti, anyways, we'll see the, sorry, I should say, we have Chianti di, okay, so we'll go to the next, please, sorry. Okay. So we're looking at the so San Giovese, some of the famous wines. So we got Canti DOCG, minimum 70% San Giovese. Um, this is the largest San Giovese growing area. And this is uh, what's important here is that there's, okay, so when we say Canti, Canti, there's Canti, and then there's Canti Classical. This is very important. And so we'll discuss this further as we go along. So, um, Chianti Classico was once uh, part of one of the subregions of Chianti DOCG and then uh, became its own DOCG. And the and it is a minimum 80% Sangiovese. In our Chianti Classico, which we'll talk about, and you see the Gallo Nero, um, this is 100% Sangiovese. Again, in Purezza, um, it is the historical part of the county. So going back to the Bando, um, we're going to the towns of Gaiole, Castellina, and Vada, which we'll talk about. Brunello di Montalcino, another Sangiovese wine, DOCG. It's 100% Sangiovese. Um, Brunello, uh, which means uh, brown or little brown, it, um, it's aged for 24 months in oak and then several months in bottle. Uh, the Brunello di Montalcino was among the first to receive the DOCG status. Uh, the so again, if we think of Chianti, Chianti, not Chianti, classical Chianti, you can often find light, lively, uh, Sangiovese. But if you think of a Brunello, Brunello is more mature, uh, darker fruit, spices, earthy tobacco it's aged in oak so that will give it much more structure and complexity so again this is a beautiful picture of uh, Montalcino um, this was also a wonderful area it's not too far from the sea and uh, 
they're known for their famous wines and part of the big, you know, the three big Bs and we have Barolo, Barbaresco and Brunello. Okay, next. So here are some of, again, I just wanted to outline uh, some member I mentioned, there were 11 DOCGs. Well, the majority of them do contain Sangiovese in uh, Tuscany. And then we had the Vernaccio di San Gimignano DOCG. So some of the other important uh, wines are also di Montalcino. So you can see the breakdown. Then we have Nobile di Montepulciano and the grape, there's some changes there as well, but the grape um, is called Prugnolo Gentile. That's the clone or the type of Sangiovese that's used. And there's a minimum of 70%. Again, all of these have specific um, regulations in terms of what their minimums and what the uh, complementary varieties are. So the uh, Noble di Montepulciano, you get darker cherries, spice, dark cherry, um, more spices. Then there's Morellino di Scansano. Morellino di Scansano is off the Tuscan coast. And so you have sandier soils. And again, 85% minimum, so it varies. So as you can see, what's important here is that each Wine has its style and its place, and it will have its own characteristics. Montecucco Sangiovese, DOCG, uh, Carmignano, DOCG, um, and the Super Tuscans. So if I say Super Tuscans, many people don't realize it's a blend of Sangiovese, and oftentimes with international um, varieties, that's the characteristic of the Super Tuscans, and also with the Carmignano. Carmignano was doing it, uh, hundreds of years ago already, and they were producing a uh, Cabernet Franc, and the Super Tuscans are mixed with the Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and some of the international, other international varieties. Okay, next. Sensory characteristics. Okay, so, um, San Giovese, or San Giovese in Purezza, it will be ruby to garnet red, uh, medium intensity. Remember, uh, for those of you who followed last time, the Nebbiolo, the pigments are, uh, they're not high pigments. It's the same thing with the Sangiovese. Um, the pigments are called what we call anthocyanins. And so it's part of the DNA or the structure. Each variety, some are have stronger pigments, others have less pigments. And so the Sangiovese, um, like the Nebbiolo, have less of the anthocyanins or the pigments, or they're really antioxidants. Anyway, so they're nothing terrible. They're just natural um, in natural compounds that we find. Um, the characteristics are cherry, cherry, cherry fruit. <laughs> it's fruit, uh, strawberry, raspberry, sour cherry, earthy flavors, leather, licorice, tobacco, uh, aromas when aged, vanilla uh, when aged. So again, the flavors will vary depending on has it aged in wood. That will make, so you'll get more tertiary um, aromas and flavors. It is floral, fresh violet is characteristic and as it ages in wood, you get more, perhaps more dried flowers. Um, when you think of Sangiovese, you think of fruit, cherry, earthy flavors, but the takeaway here is high acidity and firm tannins. Um, and so we'll see what that's like and what that's all about. When I say acidity, acidity is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Acidity, tannins, they add structure and body to a wine. So um, it's, a, it's a positive thing. However, it's important to, 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 to see how the growth of the maturity of the grape. So um, in Montalcino, which are further south, warmer temperatures, longer summers, more predictable weather, less rain, probably part, one of the driest areas in Tuscany. So you're gonna have more mature grapes, more alcohol, more structure, perhaps then less acidity compared to 
que é anticlássico, que é anti, it's hard to imagine those areas to be considered cooler, but they are cooler compared to the southern uh, Sangiovese uh, areas, which are uh, Montalcino and uh, Noble, um, um, the areas of Montepulciano. Okay, so here we have, this is a map just to show you, I, I just want to, this is a, an important takeaway that Chianti is not Chianti classical. Chianti is the, uh, the wider area, the light tan color, and the Chianti classical is the historic part, and that's the Chianti classical area uh, to know, and we'll look at that very quickly. The Black Rooster, uh, I'm going to move forward just to make sure we get to the wine tasting. The Black Rooster, there's just a, the legend about the Black Rooster, now, um, the Black Rooster, in, in centuries ago, between uh, Florence and Siena, they were always at war. So in order to uh, define their boundaries, um, they had to, uh, the two horsemen, one leaving from Siena, one leaving from Florence. And they were going to leave at the, at the crow of the rooster. So the Florentines were very crafty. Perhaps they chose a black rooster. The Sienese chose a white rooster. The Florentines took, this is the legend, the Florentines took the black rooster, put it in a dark room, um, uh, starved it, uh, and basically just kept it a little bit deprived for a few days so that when they had to open them up, it crowed earlier than, because at, at the, the, centuries ago, that's what they went by, by the natural, the crow of the rooster. So it crowed earlier. So the Florentine horsemen took off earlier and had an advantage and got farther along. And so was able to, was the winner, and basically was able to claim the boundaries, a uh, greater boundary into Siena. So that's the, um, the legend about the black rooster. Um, and so the, if the, if, there's no black rooster, it is not Chianti classical. So this is a, a, a stamp of guarantee. So, which is, is different from other areas, okay? So the black rooster, it's either here on the neck or on the label or in the back. Um, we like it here on the neck because it's very visible and that will define that your gold standard for Chianti classical. Um, okay, so basically the, um, Chianti Classical is divided into eight areas. Um, and so for this, for uh, Istine, we're going down to Rada. So you can see we have San Casciano and just heading down Poggibonzi. We have Castellina. We're gonna go to the central part of back to the Bando, which was the historical part we have um, Greve, south of Greve, we go to Rada, which is a very, very small region. This area is, this uh, area here is part of the historic part. Uh, I'm gonna move along very quickly. Um, lots of uh, mountains, forest, um, and so high altitudes. Um, okay, so let's move on here. Chianti Classico is 80 to 100% Sangiovese. Um, 20% can be made up of, it could, this is 100%, but 20% could be Colorino, Canaiolo, Nero. Um, um, white grapes at one time were allowed. They were banned in 2006, so there's no more white grapes in the Chianti Classical. Um, basically, quickly, three tiers uh, to the Chianti Classical. You have sort of the vintage year, the annata, which is aged 12 months. Then you have a riserva, which is aged 24 months. And then you have the gran selezione, which is aged uh, 30 months. And so that's sort of the top of the tier. Okay, so uh, we're gonna, uh, we're ready for the wine tasting. So here we have uh, 2017 Vigna Cavarchione. It's a single vineyard, Chianti. Classical DOCG produced by Istine. Istine is a family estate located in Rada in Chianti. Again, if you go back to Rada, the Etruscans also, uh, there are a lot of Etruscan ruins there, um, and it's um, concert, it's a it's a, a wine area, very important wine area. Um, they have vineyards in Rada as well as Gaiole in Chianti. 
and that's the town, uh, the region just under uh, Rada. The company is run by Angela Fronti, and you can see her picture here. Um, her family, uh, for many, many years, has owned a vineyard construction and management company. Angela also studied enology um, and was consulting also, there she is, with um, um, other companies. This is a wonderful company um, that uh, it's all about uh, pureness, authenticity. Um, it's not about masking. Um, and you can really get the true Sangiovese flavors. So they started the, fam the, the company in 2009. Um, there's three vineyards um, and we'll be uh, tasting from the Vigna Cavarchione, which is in Gaiole. The other two are in Rada, located at very high altitudes. Uh, the soil is Galestro and Alvarezzi soils. Um, the, they're, both, of these both of these producers are organic. Um, the altitude is 420 meters above sea level. The alcohol is 13.5%. Uh, um, the, the vineyards, you can see it's this beautiful location, uh, face east or southeast. So you can see the heights there. Um, the, the large casks, which is uh, very uh, uh, typical of traditional uh, vinification. Um, the harvesting is manual. There you have the Sangiovese. The fermentation is done in uh, concrete uh, tanks. Um, so, ah, and here, this is, a, I, I wanted to include, these are pictures obviously directly from our producers. And you can see that's the soil to show you what the, um, uh, the uh, galestro looks like in the Albereza. Okay, so let's take a look and do the wine tasting. So get your glasses. Okay, ah, uh, I did want to mention one thing that's very important. The maceration is 45 days. This is a long maceration. Quickly, I know uh, time is short, but maceration is how long um, you have the skins and the juice um, sitting together and absorbing the color um, and everything else that's coming out from the skins, like the tannins, for example. So maceration is 45 days, that's long. So when you look at this color, what do you see? It's a, ru it's a beautiful ruby color, um, transparent. You'll never get like an opaque, very dark, purpley uh, Sangiovese. Um, You can see when you swirl, it has a nice consistency about it and it just presents itself uh, just beautifully. Uh, you can see some slight um, garnet color hues along the rim as well. Okay, so most importantly, the nose. Mm. Ripe cherry. Do you, can you smell the ripe cherries? Now you want to take a few sniffs and each time you'll be able to smell other aromas. I get a little bit of leather, um, some fresh meat. I do smell a little bit of, um, this is a hard one, but uh, pencil shavings and maybe some slight nutmeg. But I do get the, the main thing here is ripe cherries, dark fruit, a bit of plum. Okay, so let's go to the palate. This is pure Sangiovese, 100% fresh. It's elegant. Now, feel on your tongue on the sides here. Make sure you, because when we drink and eat, sometimes it just goes down, but swish it around the sides. You get tannins, but they're fine tannins. They're not abrasive, it's soft. 
You can taste the acidity. Dry, but it's elegant. Fresh, it has a wonderful finesse about it. You want more, it's delicious. You can also, um, I get a subtle clementine perhaps, and you do get a bit of uh, minerality. The, the aging, um, you don't get, uh, it's not overpowering. You don't get too much wood. And that's important because uh, uh, the other thing is that the casks that they use are Slavonian and that's part of the uh, traditional vinification. So you're talking about bigger um, wine barrels. That's traditional compared to modern, which would use maybe smaller uh, bariques. Uh, but the, the, the bigger uh, barrels, you want, it's a, they're important because of the ratio. You don't, it, it's about letting the true Sangiovese come through and not masking with too much of the tertiary notes. If you perhaps, it, Sangiovese absorbs um, the wood, the tertiary flavors, and you, would, you, know, you can get the, a lot of vanilla perhaps. Um, in smaller barrels. But this is a wonderful expression of Sangiovese, which is faithful to the traditions and, and, and to the, the territory. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, ah, it should be served at around 16 degrees. And it is wonderful with antipasto. And it's wonderful with pasta dishes. Uh, tomato sauce dishes, and of course, Bisteca Fiorentina. So I can't wait to <laughs> when we'll have the opportunity. Um, otherwise, we'll just have to have it at our restaurants here in town. And so this is um, the end of our, uh, I was just wondering if there's any questions. Yes, Sandra, thank you. Um, just one question quickly. Uh, could you just briefly summarize what the difference is between Chianti and Chianti Classico and all the different varieties that there are, Chianti Riserva and all of these uh, different types? Oh. What are the main differences? Wow, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, we'll, have to have another, we'll have to have another class on that. Um, it's very difficult to generalize because that's a big question because... Um, it depends on A, if it's aged in wood and for how long. And that will give you a different style. That, so um, a Chianti, not a Chianti classical. There are many sub-regions of Chianti. So like I said, every region has its characteristics. But a Chianti can be, and it's difficult and I don't want to generalize, but it can be light and fruity and easygoing and have it with pizza. And, and that could be one of the many. Like there's... Uh, there's Rufina, Colisinesi, there's um, many subzones. Chianti Classico is uh, quality. Uh, they're all quality, but uh, it's a, it's, uh, a very con a specific area. And it is a, you know, you get acidity, you get tannins, and you get cherry flavors, which are really important. That's a sort of a, a summary there. Then if it's aged, you get fuller, more structure, more complexity, more tertiary notes. How long has it been aged for? What kind of uh, barrels are used? What kind of blends? Is it 100%? See, I chose the, these are 200% um, varieties. And so it changes. So as I was saying here, the, the pigments, for example, in San Giovese, uh, there's so much that it can go on and on, but the pigments are sort of uh, lower, lighter. They, they don't have a strong um, a percentage of, of pigments, for example. So oftentimes what's used are perhaps pig, uh, um, grapes with darker pigments, like Cabernet Sauvignon, for example. And I don't want to, and that brings us to another realm. And, and um, other types of style. So Monte uh, Brunello, again, it, it will be a riper fruit. So if you think of a riper fruit, summer, longer summers, less rain, you think of 
sugar, more sugar, riper, which translates into more alcohol, more alcohol, more structure, more complexity. Um, and it changes. So there are many factors. So it's hard to respond. Um, but my suggestion is, and this is not, uh, this is true, is try them all. It's the, it's the, it's, it's all about trying and going through, like, so if we think of gaiole, we think of greve, we think of panzano, there are differences from one region to another, even within the Chianti Classico. So if you're going to go to Montalcino, you're going to go to Montepulciano, you're going to the sandy coast to uh, Scansano, they change. And so there's a wine that's good for everybody and their tastes. And it's, do you like something that's fruitier? Do you like something that's earthier? Um, so to, to get to that, is the best way and honestly and also is to try it's just to keep trying and so this is just an introduction that's why we went with a this is a wonderful wonderful expression of San Giovese. it's a hundred percent you're not getting barik you're not get you know you're not getting other flavors that are gonna mix into that and um I hope that answers a little bit the question, but my suggestion- Thank you, Sandra. Maybe we'll have to add another uh, class only on this topic. Yeah, um, it's, it's um, there's a lot there um, in Tuscany. There's a lot of San Giovese wines and it does take time to, um, to see, you know, go out and try them and travel. <laughs> we hope soon. Yeah, hopefully soon. Um, I think tonight uh, that's it for questions from my side. So I'll, I would like to pass the word to Tiziana at this point. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Sandra. It was really great. It was very informative. But we thank you really much. And uh, we would like to thank Cavinona as well um, for uh, uh, partnering with us to present great Italian wines. I would like also to thank all our followers for uh, you know joining us um, and learning about the True Italian Taste program as well. So we really appreciate that. And next class will be on April 15th. And uh, at that point, we will feature Arianico and Montepulciano. Uh, so I look forward to having you all there. And from Eco Canada, our executive director, Corrado Faina, and uh, Astrid, Monica, and Ilaria, and myself, of course. Thank you so very much and see you on April 15th.